You know, I look around and uh, I know about three or four people. <laughs> um, but the DNA is so solid here. Uh, you guys have really been blessed. Um, bear, thank you. I mean, I, I was planning on like sneaking into the back row and just sort of hanging out with you guys and watching because we get to watch you guys on. Um, see, I'm, I'm dropping into my Wisconsin, you guys. Let me come home. I watch y'all uh, on occasion on, on TV, you know, and it's, uh, y'all do things so well, and God has blessed y'all so much, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. I, I like the series that y'all are going through right now. Very interesting and a very interesting time to, uh, to talk about this, this current topic and to discuss it. Uh, better together, which what y'all are doing. Um, good statement for the church, good perspective to have, good perspective to, to consider. Um, I like the, the vector that it's taking uh, to talk about the role and the relevancy of, of the church uh, and how it applies. Now, Barrett supplied me with uh, the thesis. He said, um, the thesis is, I'm suspicious of unchallenged structures and institutions. Then he provided me with the question to follow up, which is, um, why should I see the church any differently? So many times we find ourselves in... Um, uh, in unchallenged structures, and we, we yield to them with an uncritical way of thinking. We, we don't challenge them, and it's, it's a true statement. Now, we give them a pass because a lot of times we're, we're part of that structure, and so we just give it a pass because that's who we are. Um, and we need to look critically at, at structures. We need to look critically at ourselves, our, the way we worship, the way we think, the way we uh, consider ourselves and our own place in community. Uh, so the question is, can we take a critical and fair, because sometimes we say critical, it's not fair. So a critical and fair look at the church, uh, and then also turning it around because we have to take it from the perspective outside the church as well. So can our community also take that fair and critical um, uh, evaluation? So the problem in that fair piece is oftentimes one of trust and then value assignment. So that's some of the things we're going to look at today is trust and value assignment. Can you trust the church? Can our community trust the church? Can you, can we trust the church? Uh, and then secondarily, does the church have value? Uh, is there value in the church? And then the third part, which is the follow-up, which is really the, the one that really pulls us in is uh, does the church cast a vision for a better tomorrow for our, for our community? All right, so that's, that's sort of where we're going to go. So we're going to dig into those things uh, as we move this morning. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 3, uh, verse 14, and then we're going to go into chapter 4 and end in uh, verse 2. So I'm going to ask you guys if you could stand with me in honoring God's, uh, the reading of God's word. As I read 1 Timothy 3, 14 uh, through 4, 2, and this is what he says. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the, first keyword, household of God, which is, second keyword, the church of the living God, third keyword, a pillar and fourth buttress of the tr truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Let's pray. God, you're an amazing God. I love you. We love you. We're gathered here to praise you. We're not gathered here to praise an institution or people. You are an amazing God. Uh, you've reached down with your grace to bless unworthy people um, with an amazing amount of love. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this occasion. I thank you for opportunity to share your word. God, I know that there's nothing in and of myself that I can possibly do to, to provide value to your word. Um, but God, you put this mantle here, so I pick it up proudly with honor. God, I pray that if there's anything in my mind that is not of you, that you would remove it at this time. If there's any word that would come out of my mouth that is not yours, God, I pray that you will speak. God, I pray that you will cleanse our ears so we hear not my tonality, but your word. 
so that we can be changed because we know it's only your word that can change us. God, I pray that you will pulse that word through our bodies so that we uh, resonate your love out through our actions. I pray that you will take us away from this place different than what we came in so we can be more like you. You're an amazing God and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you allow me, I want to start with some definitions. You know, one of the, one of the big problems in society is uh, definition switching. Uh, if we don't have a definition, if we don't know what we're talking about, then it's hard to actually have a good conversation. You can't really discuss anything if you don't have definitions. So that's where we're going to, uh, that's where we're going to start because I found, especially recently, that um, the definition of the church is pretty much gone. We've, it's yielded to a social definition uh, and there have been so many alterations that we really don't have anything any longer that has real meaning or scriptural meaning. Uh, and that's one of our problems, not knowing the meaning of the church. Not only does the community not know the meaning of the church, but the church. And I'm going to start doing this a lot, so don't make fun of me because there's purpose to this. The church doesn't know the meaning of the church. So uh, let me illustrate by doing just a, like a man on the street type of thing, right? You know, I, I like those man on the street things because I think they target like the dumbest man on the street oftentimes when they do those, those things. Uh, just like when the tornado comes, they go and find that person um, in the trailer park. And, you know, that's, that's the person, you know, I'm sorry if any of y'all have been that person, but, you know. Uh, so man on the street conversation. So you're on the street and you're, you, you know, you're asking the question, why is the church important? That's your question that you ask, you know, what, why is the church important? You better be prepared for a lot of stuff uh, because there's going to be a variety of answers. The f- first, and, and where, I'm, where I live now up in Wisconsin, the, you're going to get a lot of, <laughs> because the, the whole idea of the question is invalid. Uh, because there's just there's no reason, you know, there's no reason for a church. So there's going to be laughter with a lot of that because it's not important in any way. No validity, no validity to the question. But some are going to consider the church as a power position, uh, financial power, political power, uh, the power of giving money, uh, and therefore also obtaining and retaining power. So, so some people are going to give that answer as a man on the street. Uh, others are going to consider, uh, like, you know, A Night at the Museum, one of my kids' favorite uh, shows. You know, y'all know Night at the Museum, right? So good show, right? Uh, but the problem with the museum is that it just holds things from history. It, it doesn't really produce anything for now. It's, it's things of the past. And, you know, you've, you typically go to a museum. It's like, oh, it's rainy. Where are we going to go? So on a rainy day, you may go and visit a museum whenever something bad's going on. You may go and visit a museum, but it's not someplace where you're going to go when you have something else to do right? Unless it's something you're researching. So <clears throat> they look at it as something out of touch with our modern, our modern culture. It's just something of the past, something interesting to look at, study, but not really be a part of. On the good side, some men on the street are going to say, well, uh, the importance of the church is in meeting health considerations, emotional stuff, uh, social, social stuff, um, and, and that usually happens in pivotal times in people's lives, so birth, death, um, life struggles, uh, times of flux, crises like what we have now, so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's what the church is there for, and so there is some value add there. Others will share testimonies of how the church is meeting their particular need, uh, and so they go to church so they can have a particular need met. You know, I have this need, uh, and so I'm going to church, and they're going to supply that. And so the church in some forms becomes an enabler in in that idea, but it helps people cope with life. But do those responses define the church? Is that the way the church should be defined? Because there's only one person that should be able to define it. Now, now our, our search for the man on the street continues, and we have this guy comes up, and he's, you know, uh, bearded, hat on, looks um, culturally Jewish, and we ask him the same question, say, you know, why is, why is the church important? And he has a different answer. He believes the church is the most important entity, community in the world. Pretty strong statement, right? But he supports it by saying that the church reveals the truth of the single most important event in all of human history, and that's the time when God came in flesh and then rendered his life for salvation and redemption of believers. And since his ascension, then the church has been the bodily representation of him on the earth. And so his idea is, in, he says, it's important, it's defined by the revelation of Jesus and, and the church actively revealing Jesus 
in her actions in the same way that Jesus revealed God through his actions. So let me introduce you to the man on the street. His name is Paul the Apostle. All right? So that's what Paul the Apostle sort of says in this passage. He says, this is who the church is. Uh, I love the church, but I don't like the church in the way the society has framed the term. Uh, it's not the church that I, I know. It's not the church that I read about. So I want to make sure that we start off with this definition. And let me, I want to just briefly share with you an experience that I've had. So I, I, we're, we're in Wisconsin, and uh, you know, God's blessed us during this weird year and a half. I thought I was going to go nuts because I travel a ton. I'm you know, gone half the year out of the country, and my family likes it that way. Uh, <laughs> they're like looking around like, isn't it time for daddy to go somewhere? Uh, so I thought I was going to go nuts, but God's dropped an incredible thing on, in our laps. We, so I, we have like 16, 17 church plants going, uh, about to start up. They have four different cohorts of church planters, uh, several of them in Milwaukee. I've got uh, 12 church planters in Milwaukee, uh, eight, eight black church planters, two white church planters, one Asian, a Latino, and um, an Arabic, so that's 13 actually. So uh, that's, that's what I have there. We, this last week we had a very interesting discussion, and it was about the same idea, this picture of the church, and they were, they were talking about how the, the problems with the church exist, and you, know, you can't trust the church, and blah, 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 and I said, whoa, 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 let's don't throw the baby with the bathwater. Don't throw the, the church under the bus, because you're using uh, a, a definition of the church that is not true. But what the problem is, that, and that's from church planters, right? So the culture and media presents the same type of story. And so it's inundating our society. Now the problem, here's, here's the problem. The, the problem is that there's a concern with the church and that the church has been involved with wickedness, has protected wickedness, and has been resistant to self-evaluation. Those are some of the problems that the culture sees in the church. Here's the problem with that. They're right. <laughs> That's the church. That's what the church has done. So, uh, and I, I, please hear me here. If you're only listening, hear my quotation marks. The church. Uh, they're correct. But the question then becomes who is carrying the title of church throughout history? Because they're the ones that have been involved with these things. So, it's a historical commentary on those who carry the title of church. I want to make sure that we define that. Because that's not the church. Right? So that's where we're going to go. All right? um, I, I, want, I want to make sure that we understand what we're talking about. I'm going to pull up Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. I'm going to use it probably in a different way than what we've actually considered it. But uh, here's what he says. He says, not everyone who says to me, this is Jesus speaking, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not pro prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, plural. Depart from me, you, plural, workers, plural, of lawlessness. Now, we often use this when we talk about individuals. But all those pronouns, are they're all plurals when he says, y'all, depart from me, right? He's speaking to groups of people, those who proclaim themselves to be the church. But yet they are not. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's his definition. They are workers of lawlessness. They are not the church. So up to this point, I've been talking about the church, right? Because that's the definition. But Jesus says, hey, that is not the church. You are not my people. You are me. You are not my people. So we're going to move into not the church that's been projected, but as the church has been defined. So from here out, we're going to talk about how God defines the church, because if you use a different definition, then you're, not, you're going to misunderstand. So let's make sure we understand what, how God defines his church. We must be able to yield to the purposes of God in our church instead of positions of power in the world. If we're searching after positions of power, then you're not the church. If you're looking for some leg up, then you're not the church. If you're yielding to God's purposes, now you're the church, all right? So I have three points from here. My, my, the people that uh, hear me preach, my kids especially, they call that the, 
that's me clearing my throat. The introduction part right there, that was, that's usually the longest part, so you know, relax a little bit. But me clearing my throat takes a while, the introduction part. I've got three points from here on out, and I've always been told, you know, you tell people what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them, all right? So I'm going to tell you what, what I'm going to tell you, all right? And then we'll move towards telling you, all right? And then later we'll fix that by telling you what I told you. So here are the three points. God has defined his church. I don't get to do it. God defines it. Number two, healing is proclaimed by his church. Okay? Number three, we are in a battle for his church. There's your three points. All right, that's where we're going to go. So first, God has defined his church. Verse 15 says, if I delay, uh, then this way you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. A pillar and buttress of the truth. So I simply want to look at three words in that, in that one little verse, okay? Um, because here, the, the, there's a definition that's given by the, and I don't want you to miss this because I'm not going to preach on it. I wish I could, but the living God. It doesn't say by God. It says the living God, all right? So this is how the living God defines it. And he says it's the church of the living God. So I, w- I want to look at three little words here. The first one, it starts off household, okay? Household is uh, the word oikos. Oikos means a group of people who are bound together. So the church, here's the first definition that God gives us. The church is God's family. It's not my family that God becomes a part of. It is his family that you're adopted into. I can't change the, the, the head of my family, Okay? I can't tell him what he's going to do with his family. It's his family. I get to be a part of it. The oikos is this family that we get to get together. So if you don't have a family, you have one here. If you know someone who doesn't have a family or doesn't feel like they have a family, you must make sure that they have one here. This is the place of God, the Almighty, the living God. And he says, welcome to my house. When you greet people and welcome people here, you're not welcoming them to ICC. You're welcoming them into the household of God. Make them feel like they're family. The church is God's household. Second word, the word church, it's translated church, it's the word ecclesia. Uh, man, I wish they wouldn't have translated that into church, but they did, so we we're sort of stuck with it. Uh, the church is God's assembly. Now, that word ecclesia, if you've gone to any, um, any, any churches that are based on uh, Latinization of, the, of, of language, you know, French or Spanish, you'll see iglesia or uh, something off of the word ecclesia. If you go to Germanics, they, we use the word kirsch. Kirsch is the German word for the structure of the building of the church. We use church, which comes off of the kirsch. The building, ecclesia, iglesia, is uh, the assembly. It's the people. God says it's the assembly. It's not the building. It's not a location. It's the assembly. Uh, So God's church is the assembled, united people who are united for a cause. We're talking about people that would come together and say, yes, that's our cause. We're going to fight for that. So that's who you are. God's people. The assembly together, not the building, not a location, okay? Third word, pillar, and actually I'm going to cheat, third and fourth words, but pillar and buttress. Buttress is a horizontal foundation, all right? So the buttress would be something like this, either the foundation here or the buttress which goes above a window or a door. It's a horizontal foundation that distributes a load over a mass. I think that somebody that did the I-40 bridge probably should have studied this idea, all right, just, just saying. All right, so it's a horizontal structure that absorbs the weight of, of a mass. And then the pillar is the, is the vertical structure that then that mass rests on. Each one is, is necessary. He says, that's what you are. You're the foundational structure uh, and the load-bearing structure. And he says, of the truth. He's talking about t- holding up something very, very heavy. That thing that's very, very heavy is the truth of the living God. Who is he? And that's what we're supposed to hold. God's church is called to uphold, not a position of power, but to uphold his truth. 
Hear me. The living God's truth, that's what you're supposed to uphold. Not position of power. So here's a definition. I know it's lengthy, and I should never put that many words on a slide, but okay, it happened. The church of the living, let me stress that here, the living, the living God is defined as those believers who are in his family and in his community with all other believers who embody Christ at the sacrifice of the power and detriment to their own kingdoms and who are united to uphold the truth of Jesus and his word as they have proclaimed it. So that is that one little verse. That's a definition that God's given us. Are you the church? If we can hold to that definition, we're going to go a long way, a long way towards demonstrating the value and the vision of what God has in mind for his church as we reach the nations. All right? So that's number one. God has defined his church. Number two, healing is proclaimed by his church. Verse 16 says this, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So here we have a confession of the church. This is an old confession. It's a hymn. Uh, And the hymn is basically a synopsis of the life of Jesus saying that Christ is God. He was revealed in, in human flesh, and he was the only Savior of the world. All right, that's sort of the, the purpose of that. This proclamation is the gospel, and that is the purpose of the church. So this hymn, this confession, is the purpose of the church. It's a purpose statement. It's not about acquisition of power. It's about the sharing of the gospel. The family of God should be united. There's our word from assembly, right? United to build up the value structure that proclaims a way of salvation and healing to the nations. what we're supposed to do. So notice the pattern of the passage. We're supposed to focus on proclamation, that's what he says, proclamation of his work to the nations. Now that word is the word ethnos, all right, or ethna, uh, because it's plural, but uh, ethnos, if you hear the word ethnicity, it's not nations like nation states, it's ethnicities. So all over the, all over the world, no matter who they are, people groups of the world, that's where we're supposed to focus our time. So I would like for you to consider uh, a beautiful closing of the Bible. Uh, in chapter 22 of Revelation, it's the very end of the book. I mean, if you flip all the way to the end, if you get to the index, back up just a page, it's going to be on that last page, unless you have like the presbyopic version of the Bible, which is extra large writing. But anyway, Revelation 22 verse 2 says this, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The healing of the nations. That's what the tree of life is for. Does anybody here have a piece of the tree of life? Have you drunk of the water that saves the living water? Because that's what it provides, healing of the nations. Are we healing the nations? Here, that's what God's talking about. He's saying it provides for the healing of the nations. That's just the leaves, not even the fruit, but the absorptive path to the production of the fruit is the leaf, and that is the healing of the nations. If you don't heal the nations, you don't produce the fruit. Or you produce your own. Did you graft in your own stuff? So what's the world looking for? I see a desperate need for healing in so many sections of society. The yearning for relationships, brokenness, lostness, and I'm I'm talking about lostness in the spirit, but also lostness in emotions, total brokenness. The world is crying out. The people are crying out. Memphis is crying out. Will you answer? Will you respond to their healing, to the need for healing? Hear this. There's no organization, no institution, no government that can offer a solution anywhere in comparison to the eternal solution that the church carries. It's none. You are it. The last best hope. Our message of the gospel, it moves people from a state of being enemies of God to the household of God. From enmity with the world to unity within the assembly of God. From eternal torment and separation to eternal joy in relationship. 
Consider what Paul says just previously in 1 Timothy. He says, uh, he says in chapter 1, verse 11, he says, and I'm, I'm you know, splitting this, so I'm sorry about the ellipses. I hate ellipses when I'm preaching, but you know, I sort of needed it for this. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Now, I've retranslated that because I want to make sure we understand good news. gospel means good news, blessed means happy. So in accordance with the good news of the glory of the happy God with which I've been entrusted. Sort of changes the context, right? It makes it look a little bit different. Instead of blessed, it is happy. The word Mercurios means happy. So he's the happy God. So a great part of God's glory is his happiness. God's glory compels him to be happy. Happiness beyond our wildest imagination. Could you imagine being in heaven for eternity with an angry God or with a, with a sad God? That's not, that's not my picture of joy. Jonathan Edwards, an 18th century pastor, he said this, part of God's fullness with which he communicates is his happiness. This happiness consists in enjoying and rejoicing in himself, and so does also the creature's happiness. My happiness is dependent upon his happiness. No one wants to spend eternity with, a, with an unhappy God. So could you imagine how horrible that would be? I mean, that would not be fun at all. If God's unhappy, then the goal of, of the gospel is not a happy goal. But God is happy. So the goal of the gospel is a happy gospel. It's good news. That's why we use the word good news. Consider what Jesus says. He says, well done. Enter into the joy of your master. So can there be any other structure in society that could ever have so much to offer our civilization? Joy of the Lord in eternality? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Not the unhappiness of the Lord. So that's number two. Number, here we go. Number one, two, three. God has defined the church. Healing is proclaimed by the church. Number three, we are in a battle for his church. Chapter four, verses one, two. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to, deceit, to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So for this point, I mean, let me just state an obvious here. Um, you should be able to recognize it in Memphis. If not, travel a little bit. Um, but here's a, here's a no-brainer. Here's the dust statement of the day. We're in a battle. Uh, it's not a battle for power and supremacy. We're in a battle for truth. We're in a battle for truth. We're in a battle for truth and for healing. Who can provide truth? Who can provide healing? Real healing, true healing, eternal healing. That's, what, that's where our battle lies. And the consequences of our battle are not time-constrained. They are eternal. They go on for eternity. So, therefore, the value add is not just here and now. The value add is eternality. The vision cast is not just how are we going to do this in the next one year, three year, five year, ten year. We must be prepared for this battle. Let me tell you, if you, if you don't know your enemy, then you will lose against your enemy. You know, that's why baseball, football, basketball, everybody has scouts that scout out the other team. Well, you need to scout out your enemy. If you don't know who your enemy is, that's who you need. Don't, don't, don't find the weaknesses of your friend. Look at the weaknesses of your enemies. Find out their tactics. We have to know our enemy. We have to recognize his tactics, and we have to speak God's truth. Speak God's truth in that battle. Don't rest on yourself. Don't come up with your own ideas. Speak God's truth. He is the one that, can be, that is the victor in, in this war. So let me give you a definition here. Here's my final definition. And again, apologies, a lot of stuff on the slide. The church of the living God are those believers united in his family and assembly and purpose, not just one I'm a member of the church, so I'm part of the church. No, you're a member of the church. I'm part of this assembly. No, no, you're part of the church. I like his purpose. No, you're a member of the church. If you're a member united in his family and his assembly and his purpose, then you're charged to embody Christ at the sacrifice of the power and detriment to your own kingdom So you can uphold his truth and carry an eternal solution for the healing of the nations to the nations. That's your call. 
I'm telling you, if that doesn't, if that doesn't light your flame, if, if that doesn't gig your frog, I mean, I don't know, where, wherever y'all happen to be, I can do, go on with the idioms, but if that doesn't get you going, then you're probably part of the church. And so we would call you in to be a part of the family, be a part of the assembly, be a part of the purpose. Hear what the living God says. He has trees that provide life. He has a living spring that provides life. And it's real. It's powerful. And it's healing not just to you, but also for the nations. For every ethnicity, for every person, for every people group. And he's calling you to be the carrier of it. Wow. Is there relevancy in the church? Are you kidding me? There may not be relevancy in the church. But there's relevancy in God's church, the living God church. A great composer. Now, this one's for Robbie. I don't know if he's in here somewhere. Somewhere he's in there. He's probably back there somewhere. I don't know. I had to pull up a a musical illustration. I love this illustration. I've used it several times. But um, there's a great composer. His name is Giacomo Puccini. He wrote some of the world's most glorious operas. His last one was... Uh, entitled Turan Dolt. Uh, Turan is a city, Dolt is uh, a, a woman, so it's, a, it's about a daughter. So it's about this daughter of the city. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> he dies from cancer in 1924 at the very end of about three-fourths of the way through this opera. It's a beautiful opera. People say it was his best one ever. His students were saying, please, Puccini, slow down. You need rest. Don't kill yourself over this, but he pushed through, and he did, in fact, die. Later, um, the, the opera was finished by one of his students. Two years later, in 1924, 1926, the opera was performed in Milan for the first time, and it was conducted by one of his students named Arturo Toscanini. Toscanini led the opera, and it was glorious, it was beautiful, performed exquis- ex- exquisitely, And he stopped where the score stopped, where the master had had to put down his pen. The audience applauded, but they were dismissed. The next night, they were invited back. Toscanini, his face wet with tears, looks at them and says, Thus far the master has written, but he died. Crying, he's weeping, student crying for the master. He reaches down, he grabs his baton, and he says, But his disciples, they finished his work. And he turns around and he leads the finished work of the opera Church of the Living God, Assembly of the Lord God Almighty. That's you, by the way. Our master's died. He was raised from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. And he has left with you the task of finishing his work. What's his work? To proclaim the greatness of salvation among the nations. To provide living water. To quench thirst. And to provide the leaves of the tree of life that give healing. To accomplish that task, each one of us must, four things I'm giving you here, commit yourself to a living relationship with the living God. Commit yourself to a living relationship with the living God. Number two, Commit ourselves to one another and one another as members of God's household. Commit ourselves to one another as members, co-members, equal members of God's household. Number three, commit ourselves to know, live by, and defend God's word and truth. To know, live by, and defend God's word and truth. And truth, because that's the buttress and the pillar. And number four, commit ourselves to the healing of the nations through the proclamation of the eternal 
happy gospel.